Andy Brown is a publisher and writer who runs Conundrum Press right here in Nova Scotia. I'm a big fan of the immersive and artful books that Conundrum continues to put out to the world, so it was really exciting to pick Andy's brain on the challenges of operating within a niche market that exists inside a much larger and in certain ways monopolistic market for comic books. Andy talks about starting Conundrum in Montreal in 1996, where he published a wide array of texts and experienced what he calls the last authentic bohemia. Just over a decade ago, Andy changed the press's mandate and is now focused exclusively on publishing literary graphic novels. The literary graphic novel is a relatively new term, so one of the things we talk about is what exactly that term means. What do books in this genre look like? What do they do? How do you edit them and how is it distinct from editing just prose? And what kind of work does the term itself do to invest the comic form with a certain kind of credibility? In the context of the current resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, Conundrum has launched an annual $1,000 bursary for Black and Indigenous emerging creators living in Canada. Brown has spoken publicly about how this is reflective of his desire to actually do, do something substantial to show solidarity in this moment. The books that he puts out do typically have a cosmopolitan focus on the kinds of systems that stand in the way of social justice. So the bursary makes sense as part of a larger mandate for advancing these kinds of critical ideas. The thing that I uh, wanted to kind of jump off with is this question about explaining what you do to people. People's normative understanding of comic books is that they are these superhero-driven stories about miraculous powers and the salvation of humanity. But in alternative or literary comics, the focus is less cataclysmic for the most part. Um, or if you, if there is a tragedy in their pages, the tragedy is like a human tragedy, and the goal is to sort of tell the truth about it and not invent ways out of it per se. Um, and in some of my research, I've been reading Henry Jenkins' new book, Comics and Stuff, and he talks about the kind of history of legitimating comic books uh, in the introduction. Oh, yeah. And there's this great quote where yeah. he, he says, to survive, comics needed to claim a much larger terrain to expand what stories they told. Um, they had to basically become more durable and respectable. And I guess my question yeah. for you is like, do we need to keep reinventing the terms in order to reflect the work that's being done in this visual medium? Or does the work that's done in the medium dictate the need to change the terms? Like if you're, you know, you're working, for example, on a series of shorter books now, is defining yeah. what they are a key part of bringing the books to life? Or do the books kind of determine their own definition? So you, if you take the word novel, um, and I say to someone, I'm publishing novels, like in the past I would publish novels. People have an understanding, it's a 500 year history of what a novel is. It's fiction, it's, uh, you know, it's a lengthy book. Um, however, within the, within the genre, within the form of the novel, are Harlequin romances, right? Are, are you know, the latest Giller Prize winning novel. So there's a huge difference between the reader and the quality of lit the literary quality between a Harlequin romance and the latest Giller Prize winning novel. So what I like to emphasize is the term literary graphic novel because there's so many graphic novels that are not literary. They're the equivalent of Harlequin romances. Mm -hmm. So when I tell people I do graphic novels, I have to kind of take a step back and say, you know, it's it's they're like more it's more about art and because what happened was superhero comics said, hey, look, there's these graphic novels we can sell in bookstores. So let's just combine all our issues of Superman into a book yeah. and call it a graphic novel, and then it'll sell in the bookstore. So it's now competing with literary graphic novels in the bookstores. That's another way that the term has, you know, affected everything. You mentioned the book of short stories that I'm planning. The short story form is its own thing. It has as much in it and has its own way of working the methodology within a short story has as much there as the methodology of a novel and obviously you talk to writers who do both and they will tell you that so there's no term there's a term graphic novel but there's no term for short for a short piece it's not a graphic novel let's say it's 10 pages what is it it's not a short story because it's a comic it's not a comic because it's literary it's not stapled so I'm trying to come up with this little collection of these books um, 
and have like just break down the short story into panel one panel per page so you read it like a book but it's but ultimately it's like a 10 page story that you've broken down into a book just to sort of slow it down to show that it's a story to show so a give it a spine b it can go in a bookstore c you can call it a graphic novel but it's not a graphic novel it's a short story so what i i'm trying to put out there is what do we call it you know we've got the term graphic novel let's let's do it again let's come up with a term so do you call it graphic shorts do you call it graphica do you call it the graphic short story you know what do you call it i have no idea so by all means write to me tell me what you think the history of that term graphic novel i mean it, the, the idea of a graphic novel didn't even exist until pretty much the 80s um someone like Art Spiegelman, the reason he was involved in making that was because he went to the um, library associations and there's something called a BISEC code that every book uh, has to have, which places it in a category on a bookshelf in a bookstore. So previous to this, uh, comics were floppies sold in comic book stores. And the types of people went into comic book stores were 14-year-old boys or adolescent men and that, no women, and that was about it, and that's where you would sell your comic books. So Art Spiegelman, of course, was working in a completely different field, and he was, you know, the term art comic, I suppose. There's many different ways of defining what he was doing. What I like about him, and he did a seminal publication with his wife, uh, Francoise Moulid, called Raw, was bringing together the European aesthetic and the North American aesthetic. My wife and I, we had a, an avant-garde graphics magazine called Raw, and a number of the books that, that are surrounding me are by Raw alumni, making a case for comics as being more than just uh, escapist stuff. My first notion was just, I want to make a long comic book that needs a bookmark instead of something you can read on the crapper in 10 minutes and forget, and I wanted it to be re-readable. And it wasn't even certain when I was moving toward that goal that I was going to do this particular story. I just wanted a story worth telling because the drawing is arduous. Now in this comics shop with all of these uh, graphic novels, it's hard to remember that uh, when Mouse was being made, being a comic book artist was not something you could say out loud. Uh, it was uh, um, a dubious profession at best and the only thing people could think of would be like mutants and tights or something. Uh, so there was no such thing that people recognized as a serious comic. It just wasn't a category. Well, one thing that he wanted to do, yes, is legitimize comics um, as an art form, which they in, in Europe, it, it, it's accepted. It's called the ninth art. Um, so it's already an art, considered an art form. So in North America, it was basically, okay, there are these superheroes sold at a comic shop. So there was very much the term graphic novel was used to get these what could be called alternative books into bookstores to expand the audience for comics, uh, which meant they have to have a spine because a bookstore won't take a floppy if it's stapled because you can't see the spine. So the term, so there's there's the idea of the graphic novel from the point of view of a of a distribution, the point of view of a publisher. So okay, here's a useful term, so people can understand, you know, what this is because this didn't exist before. The people making them don't call themselves graphic novelists. There's not a single person that I know making comics who calls himself a graphic novelist. What they, although in the media they might be called that, they call themselves cartoonists. Mm -hmm. And the reason they call themselves cartoonists is because it's text and image together making a third form. So this, so this, they're not making cartoons. They're using text and image together to make a third form. And that could be called comics. But when you extend it into a book, it's a graphic novel. So one, one thing that's happened is people already doing this now have a term for what they're doing. Oh, okay, I've been doing these things. Now we can call them graphic novels so I can sell a lot more. That's one thing. What I've discovered through Conundrum, because I'm kind of on operating a little bit under the radar to some degree, is that I'm discovering artists that would never have read comics. They'd never go into a comic shop. Of course, a lot of younger women who don't have the baggage of that. So the term graphic novel to them is not something new. It's just, oh yeah, here's this other art form I can use. Like, oh, instead of writing a song, instead of, you know, uh, doing a 
poem or short story, I'll make this thing that can be called a comic and someone there'll be lots of places I can get it published. And it's like, it, it, that's how I can express myself. It's a legitimate. So what's really exciting to me at this time is that the number of people that are saying that are just using the term to create new work. Because those people would never have thought about doing a 300 page Veronica Post being a perfect example would never have thought about doing a 300 page comic without the term graphic novel being in the lexicon of public culture, right? They would do something else. So Chris Olivares and our Spiegelman were the ones that sort of took this term graphic novel into the bookstores. Once that happened, it opened up this, this form to so many more readers drawn accordingly, I'm sure sells way more books in bookstores than they do in comic shops you know and the thing about direct market which is how comic shops operate is it's actually because it's become a monopoly something like a pandemic brings out the you know monopoly is going to get crushed because your whole you're so dependent on one stream of uh distribution channels that that if that gets cut off everything gets cut off so Mm -hmm. comic shops and there's a lot of comic shops that were going under uh, I'm not sure the situation now if things are coming back, but the main thing for me is just giving us a kind of systemic view of publishing, but then how you know beyond the material aspects and the technological aspects of just archiving these works, there's also a definitional aspect. So it really, it's that combination of the material and the definitional that I think is so interesting. You're kind of doing more writing now on the kind of trajectory of comics and trying to kind of theorize this really interesting development of of a new medium into something more established and some of the kind of, you know, strange hierarchies. You mentioned uh, in your interview with Noah Van Skyver, the essay that appears in the volume of BDQ, uh, Essays and Interviews on Quebec Comics that you edited. You know, you're a person who's kind of embedded. So like, while you have an academic lens, you're also personally invested, obviously, in comics. Um, You're in the trenches, as it were. And, and so I felt like, you know, the way that you wrote about the germinal zine, Fish Piss, for example, which is such an incredible title for a zine, um, set, up, oh, yes. set up some interesting terms for, like, thinking about what comics do. You talk about how the bohemian alternative zine culture of Montreal represented a truly bilingual moment of cultural production, and you come up with this notion of linguistic capital. How has your thinking on this idea um, uh, developed, right? The radical potential of this. Yeah, well, <clears throat> that's interesting. Yeah, because to, to back up a little bit, that the reason I wrote that in the first place, I mean, I put together the whole anthology on, on Quebec comics because nothing like that exists in English. And I had lived in Montreal for 20 years, and I, yeah, I, just, I was massively inspired by the Francophone underground comics. Um, and they were just so outside anything that I could have comprehended just seeing in Canada. Um, but these people who, you know, were just like us, that French, on the Francophone side, who couldn't speak any English, some of them were making these comics, and, you know, they were just making little zines and mini comics and stuff, and, you know, no distribution, really, just to their friends. Or these, there's a number of French comic book shops that were around that, took them on and stuff and uh, but they were just as underground within me because in montreal of course french is the mainstream culture so as anglophones we were completely alienated and outsiders so we just took on without even really knowing what we were doing we were doing this um diy um culture out of necessity because there were no grants there was no there were no publishing houses, so, you know, I mean, Drawn and Quarterly started, but, and so they, but they were mostly publishing Europeans and, and people in Toronto and, and, you know, with more power to them, but also very small at that time. So, and, and also to emphasize, this was 1995 was a huge time in, in Montreal because it was the referendum to separate and as we were living there, it was this very strange thing because the whole culture was completely outside everything. So for even mainstream French culture was completely outside North American culture. You would see, you know, the hugest, biggest movie star in the province on the cover of a magazine, and every single person in that story knew who that was. But I had no idea who that was. Hmm. And, you know, anyone else in North America would have no idea, right? So 
It's just completely outside. So that's mainstream French culture. And then there's this whole underground French culture, which I was more associated with. And then Anglo culture was just completely off the charts. There was just nothing. Like, we were just ignored by Toronto, New York. Like, nobody knew what the hell was going on. So we were essentially stewing in our own juices. So when this zine called Fish Piss came out, it was a bit of a revelation because this guy, Louis Ristelli, he's a diehard Montrealer, bilingual, who was very much involved in the punk uh, DIY uh, music scene, who was also a writer, you know, was able to write interesting articles and he interviewed interesting people on the streets and at bars. And But what he did was he brought in a lot of these French cartoonists. So I basically used his his zine, Fish Piss, to talk about those particular cartoonists that really influenced me when I was living in Montreal. And then basically I started translating their book and putting them out in English so that people in all over, well, the English-speaking world, I guess, could have access to what was going on. So that's why I sort of started thinking about, well, why was this so special to me? Maybe it's special to other people too. And the thing that he did was, Louis did, was he brought in a lot of European uh, techniques like silk screening covers, which no one had done up to that point. Um, now, you know, with risographs and all sorts of other printing techniques, it's much more common to see like beautifully printed um, underground publications. But and, and that it's just the idea of bringing together all of these different disparate elements. So I, over the pandemic, I took some time to actually expand this idea beyond the comics and and talk about how that zine was representative of what was going on in the culture and the anglophone culture specifically in montreal from 1995 to 2005 and when you sit back and look at it the stuff that was in that zine i could name drop 20 people that everyone in north america would have heard of because they're super famous but their first publications were in that zine. Hmm. Um, and including, and one big element was the Godspeed You Black Emperor, which became a musical sensation and really stayed true to their Montreal roots and very political. <clears throat> but they, they were in the neighborhood. Like they had a, and one of the other things I started to do was like, well, okay, is this, was this Bohemia? Is this what they talk about, like Paris in the 20s? Like, so I started researching different Bohemian communities and discovered that there's a timeline and there's an actual beginning, middle, and now I would argue end. I would I would argue that Fish Piss was sort of representing this Montreal Bohemian community was actually the last one. So I call it the last authentic Bohemia because I don't think it can happen again. And there's and so that's part of what my argument is. When the main reason, of course, gentrification, but mostly social media has replaced bohemianism and you know i could go on and on a million years about that but so i did a lot of research into different bohemian communities and, and you know sociological studies and one the one thing i discovered that was consistent to all of them was venue there's a venue in a neighborhood where it's a focal point and uh, a publication so obviously we had the publication in fish piss so I started going back and trolling my memory and looking at old posters and stuff. And I realized there was uh, a number of venues in Montreal at the time that facilitated all of this. Because uh, it was like uh, one was like a spoken word series that happened in a particular venue. And then that brought together certain comic artists and poster artists and writers. And I also discovered people who came to Montreal specifically because there was a bohemian paradigm in existence and there's like documentation of people who came you know rented out a big loft put on parties with bands made posters you know published zines very similar to fish piss and then moved on to new york and became advertising executives you know like this is very much this trajectory and it's it, it fascinates me that this all was happening and i was living it so yeah, that was, so the essay in there was the comics part of it. So then I, I went on to expand the whole thing and made a whole book out of it, which I'm now trying to get published. So we'll oh, wow. see how that goes. You know, yeah. certainly the notion of an end to Bohemia to me is like a convincing idea. Like you're talking about an end to Bohemia yeah. as a potential paradigm because of these social factors that cre seem mm -hmm. to 
seem to produce a certain kind of fragmentation. Like even even as social media is kind of a unifying force, it's still sort of an individualizing force too, right? So there yeah. isn't there isn't necessarily the po- the possibility of you know coalescing around a scene, um, you know movements. What? Tend, you know exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, the the symbol that I use for the social media is is you, you picture so in the in Bohemia you always think okay there's this specific, like let's just take the 1950s in. Um, Montmartre in, uh, not Montmartre, uh, Montparnasse in Paris, where you have Sartre and de Beauvoir and uh, James Baldwin and these people, and there's a specific cafe, the Cafe Floor in, in uh, Saint-Germain-de-Prés, that they're all hanging out and they're making a book, uh, magazine called Le Tom Martin. So it's very similar. It's like a, there's a venue, there's a publication, they're all meeting there, discussing the venue, they're discussing the publication and their works and, you know, reading and this and that. Nowadays, you go, A, that cafe doesn't exist because it's a Starbucks, Hmm. because it's corporatized, and then B, let's say it does, and in Montreal there were certainly lots of these cafes, and I'm sure there are everywhere, there's still a few of these little mom and pop cafes or whatever, but B, people go to the cafe to open their laptop and communicate with other people on Facebook. So you're actually going to the cafe to be on social media as opposed to going to a cafe to not be on social media, right? You're not doing the social media at home. You're doing it in the cafe. And that's the new paradigm is you sit there with your laptop open at Starbucks to find your scene, which is on Facebook, as opposed to finding your scene in the cafe. Mm-hmm. That's why Bohemian is, is dead. And it's funny that, you know, there are cafes that clearly have a certain kind of nostalgia for Bohemia. And for that reason, we'll just like sure. decide not to provide Wi-Fi in order to force people to connect with one that's, another. Well, that's true. Too. Yeah. That's, so there's this kind of backlash. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the that zine culture of, you know, a Francophone underground couldn't have dreamed of how the Internet would organize us and orient our work. But it still kind of does, of course. But, there, you know, beyond that, you, I think... The interesting thing for me is like you talk about the process of discovering artists and how it seems to be more about high profile in-person events like TCAF sure. and, and that you're you're not taking electronic submissions. So I wonder then how right. almost the kind of temporality <clears throat> of projects getting pushed forward in that context. I mean, a collection like Nova Graphica, for example, comes together kind of organically and really represents the process of creating a scene today in this kind of fragmented way. Sure. So like the, what I'm interested in is how that maybe influences the product. I mean, no, Nova Graphica seems like a book that is historical and current, personal and political. And it really seems to yeah. be a perfect example of this blend of the, the not the underground, but the on the ground perspective and this, this possibility of comics to push boundaries a little bit. So one of the things that I do, so first of all, Nova Graphica is, um, it's a, an anthology of comics uh, about the history, uh, historical comics, nonfiction about Nova Scotian history uh, that's edited by Laura Kennins. So it's not my idea. There's a number of people in the book who have since moved to Toronto because that's where they can have a career. The idea of an anthology in general is sort of a way of forcing a scene upon a group of artists or people so that sort of is what would be going on here i would not really say that it's a representative of a nova scotia comic scene so much as the vision of maybe an editor and in in the same way that any editor has influence over the content of an anthology so i would say that it's a slightly different thing but at the same time because as you say i'm on the ground i tend to discover people who are outside the margins and bring them in to things like this anthology like there's a number of people that i knew were making work who never had books out well veronica initially would be one of them who i brought in simply because you know i said okay this is an interesting person doing interesting work but no one's going to know who this is, so let's bring them into the fold by publishing them in an anthology. That role, being an editor, is particularly interesting, I think, when you're running an independent comics publisher. I mean, you, you talk in, in the uh, contribution you make to the 20 Years of Conundrum Press anthology about how the move to editing graphic novels meant that you could do less heavy lifting. There have to be specific challenges with editing graphic novels that are just different from editing novels. Oh, yeah. 
And I wonder, you know, if, if people have even really thought about what those are. I mean, th some things have to be consistent, like pacing, but then other things must be kind of intuitive. Maya Merrick writes in that book about how she implicitly had to trust you as an editor. And like a lot of artists, you know, Sherwin Tia talks about the ways that the editor has to make decisions about when to say no. And, and I love the way that Merrick puts it in particular. She says, your job was to bring a critical eye to something made in solitude. Is editing for you mostly an intuitive process? Is it a, a kind of standardized thing? Are you looking for specific stuff? Or is it always this deeply social collaborative process that involves a degree of trust? Wow. Okay. So when I first started out, I was, yes, editing people like Maya, who is, you know, a very talented writer writing novels. But I would have to look at, you know, the full manuscript of a novel, let's say 300 pages. So that's just to read a 300 page novel, you know, takes a day or two. Uh, to read it with an editorial eye takes a week. And then what I would do is, I guess, I guess you could say it would be intuitive. I would think about, you know, what's propelling the story, what, you know, oh, this, this, this part in here that seems like it's going off on a tangent. You don't need this. This is, as a reader, this is distracting me, you know, and then there's big chunks taken out. Or, oh, you're missing, like, you know, we don't know who this character is. Like, where did they come from? And, oh, okay, so you add that back in. So with a novel, the process of editing is months and months and months of, as I say, heavy lifting. Is we're, And often the writer is like, well, you know, oh, I really like that character. Or I really like that line. I'm like, well, why do you like it? And often the reason was because it was the first one. Or it was my original idea. And like, that is the problem. You're holding, you know, you have to kill your babies. You need to chop off the original idea because you've moved beyond that. To me, I mean, I have a background in, in English lit, so I've read a lot of English lit. I've studied a lot of English lit. I wrote a master's thesis on English lit. I wrote my own novels. I'm a writer and a reader and a critic, I guess. So I brought all that to novels. So when I switched to comics, what was interesting was obviously there's not 300 pages of text that you have to sit down and organize. So the same sort of intuitive process exists where you're like, well, what's this character doing? Or, you know, uh, you're, you're missing a whole section here or, or that. So it's, it's much broader strokes, I guess. I think Megs Fitzgerald is someone who came to me originally with this ginormous, uh, idea for her book photo booth the biography it was like you know a thousand pages and everything she'd ever thought about in her entire life was going to go into it so my job was sort of to rein her in a little bit so with Megs it was it was uh, <laughs> she was very attached to certain things that I was basically just saying no you need to get rid of this and she's like so and then she would go away for a couple of days and then come back and say uh, I always remember what she said to me she said well you do have a reputation for getting it right so that's what you're talking about, I guess, this yeah. element of trust. So I said, yes, okay. And that's because I've done this before and I have 25 years of experience. Um, so, yeah, so there is an element of trust. But I'm also at the same time able to step back and say, well, no, it's your vision. You know, if, if you know, as long as you know, you're not offending anybody, if this is what you want to, well, or you sometimes even if you are offending some people, but, you know, this is your vision. And I, I don't want to edit it to make it fit a certain, category or to make it safe or to make it anything else it's your vision but i'm here from with like my critical lens as someone who's been trained in editing to give you advice and i imagine you know that's definitely a thing you have to develop is that reputation for getting yeah. it right and i think it's interesting that you talk about like using um a critical lens that understands the medium itself too without making yeah. it conform to like a specific iteration of that medium yeah. like this is, this yeah, is and you mentioned you mentioned pacing. That's a big thing in comics editing mm. is the pacing. So some people get it, especially when it's a book length comic. Like you can tell us, you can tell you can have a scene in one page or twenty pages. It's the same scene, but it, the reading experience is vastly different mm. because of the pacing, right? Sure, there are ways that you can slow down your reader. Absolutely. Um, well, another another example is is the way com you read comics often is there's no word. This is a really hard thing to get across to people who don't understand the comics medium is that you can have an entire graphic novel with no words. 
Right. And if you read it, it's written. Mm. Someone has written that book. And they're like, but there's no words. It's not written. Yes, it's written. So how is it written? It's written in the symbols of, the symbols of comics. Things like expressions on someone's face. So in 10 pages, some, you could just have someone's face and it goes from horror to fear to happiness to joy. All of this stuff can be happening with no words because mostly because of the eyebrows. So this is something you know from drawing comics or reading a lot of comics that the eyebrows will are you're writing with eyebrows basically in comics porn. But people who never read comics, that's like you're telling them that they're going to the moon tomorrow, right? I mean, they have no concept of how that works. Yeah, and, and you know, it kind of leads me into this other question about uh, something Mer- Merrick also discusses in her entry in the 20 Years of Conundrum Press book, uh, this puzzle of whether audience or audiences are going to like a book, understand it, buy it. Existing as the sort of publisher you are must mean that you have to make these kinds of decisions about how to choose books that are going to gain a certain kind of publicity and, and if not suit your brand, at least be part of this vision that you have as an editor. And so, like, this is why I wonder whether you steer clear completely of books that are, like, pure experiments with form uh, and don't have a high degree of narrative structure, you know, research or a clear intent. There are lots of examples, for you know, in the portable conundrum collection of graphic works that, you know, really test the limits of coherence and, and mess with convention. Um, but you're not generally putting out books that just discard narrative structure in favor of pure play. Do you feel like there are limits, basically, to what readers will like when it comes to avant-garde gra- graphic novels? Yeah, I think I think I did when I first started. I was far more experimental. Like basically, what I was doing was making work. By making work, I mean making books. I mean, obviously, there were artists and writers making the work, and then I was putting the book together. But to me, it was an art. It was it was an art form. Publishing is an art form, and to, it was very much my way of expressing my creative self was to make these books. So often, yes, they were extremely experimental and, as you say, pushing the boundaries of kind of genre and form. So that is my background. It is still what I hope to do. However, what I realize, and again with the term graphic novel, is that there are certain expectations people have with the, the book form, I guess, and comics. You also have to understand that, you know, especially within Canada, there's really very, very, very few. It's extremely niche, right? So a literary graphic novel uh, or experiment or av- the avant-garde in general is extremely niche and by definition, I guess, especially in Canada, especially in English. So I, I was making these kind of avant work, avant-garde works and they were receiving some attention. So then I was like, well, but no, other than Chris at Drawn and Quarterly, who wasn't necessarily publishing Canadians, nobody seemed to be doing this, doing the more sort of literary graphic novel. And I was like, well, this is exciting. Like, this is a, a, you know, sure, there's the experimental work. There's the stuff that I want to see that doesn't exist. But these literary graphic novels also don't exist, Hmm. specifically by Canadians. So, of course, they exist all over the world, especially in France and Japan. So what I did was I said, okay, the Canada Council of the Arts provides this grant funding for publishers and so I was like well how you know how can I get on that gravy train kind of thing so I I was okay well I need to make these this number of books and they have to look like this and so this is what I was doing as a process and then I realized at one point that as a publisher I was expected to define my mandate so because nobody else had a mandate like literally like out of 140 publishers that in Canada English publishers there was nobody who had a mandate of literary graphic novels. Drawn and Corley did, uh, but such a small part of their of their work was Canadian, which of course they were also getting grants for, uh, and of course amazing Canadians like Seth and Chester Brown and Julie Desett and sure, all great stuff. But you know, one out of 140 isn't much. So I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to focus my mandate to literary graphic novels. And at the time, I was doing it sort of like, okay, this is, you know, a way to keep getting grants and this and that. But what had ended up happening was it opened up an entire planet to me as representing Canada in international comic art festivals. Suddenly, I was getting invitations to go to Helsinki and Paris and, and sign rights and, you know, go to Sweden and, you know, whatever, like all over the place, uh, 
so then I sort of said, okay, maybe I should be publishing some people from, so I had, I started up an inter, um, international imprint at that time, the translation, but that's a whole other story. But the idea of between, so I still had my head in the avant-garde, but in a way, literary graphic novels are the new avant-garde to some degree. But in now the graphic novel has become sort of a slightly entrenched. It's hard to call something entrenched. It's been around for 25 years, but... Um, I feel I could be doing a lot more avant-garde work. Um, and to some degree, I mean, sometimes I publish things that I think are totally avant-garde and then people are like, oh, this thing is like super popular. They like, oh, okay, I just did this because I thought it was avant-garde, but it turns out that it's not, <laughs> you know, or whatever. It yeah. has an audience. Okay, great. And, or vice versa. I do something that's, this massive 400 page narrative autobiographical comic that I think is totally amazing and doesn't get any attention. So, you know, who knows? It's, it's hard to say. So ultimately I have to kind of just follow that vision. For sure. And, um, I think I wanted to talk about that vision in relationship to, um, seeking works that aren't originally written in English and some of the challenges with that. I mean, you know, one of the books that I've been reading is, um, Catherine Ocelot's, uh, art life, which is a book that I'm just so grateful is available in English and in which is quite avant-garde in the sense that I've never seen people represented that way. And in such, you know, surreal, dreamy ways, I just, you know, I'm certainly wondering specifically how you got involved with that project. I know that Conundrum is self-consciously a cosmopolitan sort of small press. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, like you've mentioned, for example, on Van Skyver's show that you're interested in people who are writing outside of a certain hegemony in we'll Belgium. Say Franco-Belgian. Yeah, yeah, and you kind of mentioned Japan as well as being one of these hegemonic Japan. kind of, you know, pools of Absolutely. comic production. Um, you're exploring all the all these different places, and I guess, you know, uh, um, with a translated work, how do you determine whether it suits the press? I'm asking you too many questions, I realize, but, um, mm. you know, I'm, I'm also li- interested in little things, like how the lettering of a translation changes potentially mm-hmm from another language into English and whether that changes the overall impression of the way that you read the text and all of this stuff. Certainly art life has a very particular lettering style that I wonder how faithful that is to us a lot's original text and whether that matters. Again, lots in that question. I'm going to start with, uh, with Catherine's book. So yes, uh, Alicia Jensen, who I started using as a uh, translator, She's in Montreal. She translated uh, some Max de Rodriguez books for me. And then so she came to me and said, uh, you know, this, this book by Catherine Ocelot, it won a big award in French. And, and you know, and she's great. And, you know, she's well known in the alternative comic scene here. What, you know, what, nobody seems to want to publish this in English. What happened was I said, oh yeah, okay, it looks great, why don't you translate a section and send it to me? So she did that, and Catherine, I think, even re-lettered it, and that's the section that I put in my catalog, it's like an eight-page section, and really it was just dialogue, most of it was just dialogue, and I was just like, oh wow, this is so great, this dialogue, it's funny, it's really well written, it, 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 you know, there's so much going on, and then the rest of the book, of course, it's extremely visual and beautiful colors and stuff, so... I was like, well, if it's, you know, if this person can write like this and it's beautifully drawn, let's just do it. So that was pretty much how that book came about. Other books, uh, like the one, um, Adrian Denomay's 100 Days of Uranium City, that came about because, again, of the translator, Helga Dasher, who I can't say enough about. She's the premier comics translator in North America, I would say. So she translated that one, The Hundred Days of Uranium City, which is an interesting uh, book in a lot of ways. It's extremely poetic. It's very slow. It's very gorgeous. Um, one, so one of the things that they wanted, and Catherine's too, so one of the things that was important was the production of both those books with the lettering. So the publisher, she said, uh, Adrian said, I, you know, I can't do this in English unless my French publisher does the production. So she personally relettered it. And then the same with Catherine Ocelot, because of the uniqueness of the lettering style, like, you know, if you insert a font, it's going to look, it's going to completely change the whole reading experience. So she hand lettered that whole thing herself, um, you know, which I paid her to do. Before there was font making software, 
that's what everyone did. Like, there's, so in Europe, there's a lot of letterers who mimic original handwriting. But then with the advent of font making software, that kind of was lost a little bit. Hmm. So I am lucky to have come around at that time. So a lot of the books that you do, we make a font out of the artist's handwriting. But then when you come into a lot of issues with, so part of writing comics is onomatopoeia. So it's the sounds that are appearing in the background, like, you, you know, slamming a door. So in English, slam! Right. You see a big in big letters. If you just take French, they they don't they don't use the word slam when they shut the door. It's slam, or it's different. It's not a font. It's hand drawn, uh, but it also might go over top of the kitchen cabinet or whatever. Like it's in, integrally embedded into the picture. So you actually have to edit in Photoshop. So you have to hand. So I often go into Photoshop, erase stuff with the rubber stamp, and uh, you know have to hand do it. And if I if it's too integral in the image, I have to get the artist to redo it. Hmm. So that happens quite a bit. So sometimes, like Catherine, also has a good example. So she had a Quebec edition, and then there's a publisher in France who published it in a French edition. So they translated it from Quebecois to French. And had a different cover design and everything, right? Mm. So Julie Doucette's a perfect example of this used to happen to her. And then when she became better known, they stopped translating the Quebecois <laughs> into, mm. into, into, uh, into Académie Française, I guess. So I find all this fascinating. And then, so then when I expanded, I realized I could publish any buddy from anywhere in the world and so when I was going to like Angoulême and buying and selling foreign rights mostly I was trying to sell them but um, and I did I sold a few books into French and other languages um, I realized how many other publishing companies in other languages there were and other artists doing stuff in multiple languages so I just started saying okay I can do one of these a year and so I started an international imprint I've done about 15 books that way as well Traveling to these festivals, I mean, just personally, has really been some of the, the greatest, uh, you know, professional experiences of my life, just being able to travel the world and meet like, my, like meet my tribe, but in, you know, Helsinki, right? I mean, it's amazing to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I hope eventually you'll be able to get back to doing that. I don't want... <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't want to take too, too much of your time. You've been so generous with okay, it today. Sure. So the thing I wanted to ask is about uh, cover design. You know, covers give okay. a clear signal of what readers are getting. And I notice that sometimes you'll lean into the idea that these are pure art books and produce covers that really evoke that. And then other times you seem to deliberately evoke the style and layout of like well-known series of books for major pub publishers like Penguin and Viking. And I wonder about that too, like how consciously either artistic or mar market-oriented are cover design choices. And is there something consciously satirical about gesturing to the cover designs of major publishers are you playing with the idea of like legitimacy of graphic texts in doing that kind of thing well i mean the main the main one that you're probably referring to is the uh the burton and forbes the hobtown mystery stories which play off of the hardy boys and nancy drew covers and the portable which, you know, isn't I, the, yeah isn't the portable conundrum all and right? the portable conundrum that's true yes i see i forget what i've done Yes, the Portable Conundrum was my 10-year anniversary anthology, and that was because I was, I'm was i a big fan. Well, because, you know, I'm, I'm a publisher, and as I say, I treat it as an art form. So I, I am very much invested in looking at uh, the history of it and, and, and different design ideas and stuff. So yeah, that was uh, the Viking Portable series. So there was a conscious effort to try to, to, to mimic that. But yes, ironically so. I mean, design is, I've, I've never studied design, but obviously it's, it, it's a big part of publishing, so I do all the own, my own design. But since I've switched to uh, comics and graphic novels, most, almost, I would say all of the cover designs have come from the artists. So I am basically, my role is to just say yes or no. So if there's some, some of them come fully formed, like Chris and Alex with their, with their uh, Hardy Boys parody. I mean, it's completely 100% Alex just drawing, painting an old cover and scanning it and sending it to me. Like, I don't, I don't touch that. I don't have any input into that. I'm like, this is amazing. Let's do it, right? So 
other times there'll be people who have the book and there's no cover and I say well let's take this panel from the book color it and you add some lettering okay yeah let's do that so that's my that's more of my input sometimes like for example this new um single story books uh, comic stories uh the series i'm going to do is very much based on the uh faber and faber uh single story books um so there's classic short stories along with new short stories so there's old people new people uh, stuff from the 50s, stuff from the 30s, stuff from today. But there is one, because I guess they're Adrian Tomini's, uh British UK publisher, uh, there's one of his short stories in there, in that series called Intruders. So I found this, I'm like, oh my God, this is a, this is a story, from, I think it's from Shortcomings, done in this format. And I, that was just like light bulb mm. moment went off. And I was like, why don't I do a whole series like this too? I, you know, I'll go into archives. I'll try to find some new artists who don't have entire graphic novels. Maybe they've only ever written a short story and we'll get them in there. And people who've never been published before. Also, people I've published before, uh, you know, work that's never been published. Maybe reprinting work in a different way. Like, you know, uh, this whole idea of the new format reprint. So, again, that's playing off of like a traditional publishing form. The cover designs themselves usually are generated from the the artists themselves which actually for me talk about heavy lifting like that that was a big deal when i was publishing novels and short stories and fiction so you're working with people who are writers some of whom have zero design or artistic eyes right they have no concept so you have to present 20 different cover designs and they keep getting rejected and eventually you say well we're going to go with this or that and then they might not like it or you know it, the cover design for a novelist is a big deal like it, it, it takes a lot of work it's a lot of back and forth it's a lot of creative energy on my part from a designer's point of view i mean most people hire designers for that reason right so i never could afford to hire a designer so i taught myself all that so when i switched to comics i would say oh my god here's here's the cover you've done it already great Let's print it, right? So it made it much easier. So, but then again, it's also, you know, it represents the inside of the book perfectly because it's the same artist. Whereas with a novels, uh, with fiction, it's very, that's part of it is to represent what's happening inside the book without being too literal. Um, so, yeah, thanks so much for talking to me. Um, I won't take any more, more of your time you've been really really um, oh well yeah. thank you so much well as I say no I don't think anyone's ever read my anthology so uh, so carefully so thank you for being a good reader hey <laughs> careful reader yeah it's one of my favorite things